circle economy is a new narrative that sparks the imagination of businesses and policymakers. It aims at closing material flow cycles, at using renewable instead of finite resources, and at replacing fast fashion consumption patterns with long-term and shared use of goods. What elements constitute the idea of a circular economy and what business opportunities arise from this concept? These are the questions I would like to discuss with my guest in this week's Responsible Innovation Story. My guest is Ken Webster. He is a global thought leader on circular economy and has an extensive track record in this field. Ken is senior lecturer at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom and guest researcher at Linköping University in Sweden. Between the years 2010 and 2018, he was head of innovation for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation a leading organization promoting the uptake of circular economy worldwide. Ken, thank you very much for taking the time for this interview today. What are the key elements of circular economy and why did it become so popular? The concept of circular economy as it became known after around 2010 was rather different to how it was being deployed before then. Before that period around 2010, it was mostly originating in the, in the academic literature from China and it was largely around industrial ecology. Now, on the inception of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, and the publication of their first result, uh, report towards the circular economy, um, the, the framing of it had changed. And that was a deliberate exercise in framing and narrative. The aiming of the framing and narrative was to make sure it had impact with business and civil society at, at the policy level. Uh, I decided that the framework we should use would use the living systems metaphor. That means that it was essentially designed to fit with the existing uh, perceptions of how the economy works, but it fixes something. In this case, it fixes the, the material cycle uh, as an economic and business opportunity first, which would spin off social and environmental benefits. It was not designed to be sustainability because sustainability had a rather different framing. Uh, I claim that framing was more around responsibility, individual and social responsibility. It often used a lot of guilt and it often looked like the way to get it would be to regulate industry. So I rejected all of that as not very useful if you want a framework that would catch fire. We, we were working on a, an eco-modernist agenda which went beyond waste management. It was about product design, delivering products as service, extended product use, refurbishment, reef manufacture. And at the edge of this, there is recycling and waste yep. management. There's no money <clears throat> to be made on the outer loops compared to the, the way money could be made on the inner loops. And in terms of resource using, recycling is really a linear economy that's bent back. If you have to do recycling, fine, but you've lost most of your potential for value added before you do that. It was a fairly well thought out campaign by an NGO who also had the advantage of a particular set of circumstances, which were that post the 2008 crash, uh, most governments were very keen to get jobs and growth going in some way. The other element I should say in terms of circumstances was digital. Uh, I often say digital meets business models meets design. Digital was um, loosening up, if you like, the framework for how things were done. So you had much more opportunity to track and trace materials, monitor equipment in use, uh, service things uh, remotely, if you like, if it's, if it's digitally uh, accessible. What was this business opportunity they saw in this concept? The business opportunity is, a, is around different forms of resource efficiency primarily, but there are many different business models which got revived around the renting, the leasing, uh, products of a serv product service systems of all types. Uh, these were quite exciting for, for many people and are still, it's still ongoing, all of that. Um, you know, the service systems such as putting um, washing machines as a pay by use. This pay by use notion uh, was, was accelerated because of the digital revolution. You could see what was happening. And in an era of low growth, low productivity in, in, in many ways, uh, the idea that you're going to have ever more customers was an, of interest, I think, to businesses. You weren't going to get ever more customers with a saturated market. You only had replacement customers. 
So tying customers into a business model which meant more loyalty to a particular firm is and, and, and will be of increasing interest to businesses because you're not going to be sell more, but you might be able to tie a customer into uh, subscription services, to uh, longer contracts. So all of these things are much more possible with the digital regime. Uh, and to get away from the idea that you have to keep selling more, which is going to be increasingly difficult in which sectors do you see the highest potential for big steps forward toward circularity? The heavy, the heavy equipment, locomotives, infrastructure, trains, planes, um, manufacturing equipment and so on, capital goods like that. Because it's, it's really quite, they've been doing it for a long time anyway, but they can extend uh, the, the product life of these things, uh, refurbish, repair, monitor it as it goes. That's been a traditional one, and I think there's a lot in it to that. Uh, I'll flip to say that the area that is no use at all is short cycle, valueless goods. A lot of effort's been put into plastics. It's mostly, in my view, misguided. The question they don't ask is, well, some of them do, but is this the right material for this purpose? So. The big areas uh, are around machinery, also in uh, various things like um, housing as a service. It's all as a service stuff. That's very interesting, particularly to asset owners. Uh, it's probably in clothing, clothing as a service. That's picking up, though a lot of clothing is too low value to make sense, uh, to make sense of that one. But it's the larger equipment, plus on the biological side, it's regenerative agriculture. Uh, you need to be able to rebuild soils and uh, take carbon in anyway. So let's get on with regenerative agriculture, where the you know, where the benefits are fairly um, easy to see. Are there any limitations? Well, the limitations, of course, are the system conditions in which businesses are operating. It's very hard to make the case for uh, refurbishing, uh, applying human activity to products and components to extend product life. When, for instance, the energy costs are really, really low, you know, and, uh, energy costs don't even meet the real costs, let alone uh, the real business costs, let alone the externalities. So a lot of the primary production is uh, subsidized so that um, it makes it an unfair market when compared to refurbishment and so on, as particularly when you think that uh, most taxation is on uh, income and consumption not on resources, not on waste. So the whole setup in, in terms of the, the rules of the game are, are highly skewed against a circular economy. What kind mm. of role does innovation play on, in the transition towards a circular economy? It's often too much looked at in terms of technology. Uh, one of the biggest innovations possible is in ownership. Who owns businesses? Why not more cooperatives? Why not more central enterprises? Why why is employee ownership so uh, uh, so rare? Um, it's not in, it's not extinct at all. But why should ownership and control of the business be divorced as it is with most with with, with companies on the stock exchange? That would be an innovation to move towards many much more su support or encouragement for for different forms of ownership. That's an innovation. Um, circular economy makes use of the metaphor of biological systems and translates these principles to the economic system, circularity. Are there any other properties of biological systems that we have to consider when we translate these? All living systems uh, operate at many scales. They're fractal in nature. We know that. And uh, there is an interplay between efficiency and resilience. Uh, the efficiency element is related to structure and flow. Resilience element is is related to exchange and, and uh, redundancy, if you like. Um, so all of these uh, living systems are in interplay between efficiency and resilience, and that gives you effective systems. Um, so we're chasing effective systems. So they have to work at all scales. Now, that means that there has to be a great deal of diversity. We celebrate diversity in the circular economy because particularly on the more local and regional levels, a lot of the way in which the economy works is not cookie cutter. It doesn't come out of a box stamped. It's, it, it has to have its sense of place and use the resources which are available. And um, 
It also means, though, that, that, that it requires different policy approaches. The general economy is really looking at the structure and flow. It looks at the big flows. And for that, it's about the fewer nodes and connections as possible. Uh, so you get the throughput. But um, these make for brittle systems. It's almost like designing a tree with just one big leaf. It's very efficient, but we know in practice one big leaf makes that tree vulnerable if it's just got one leaf. So we know that, uh, just using that tree analogy a little bit more, that the structure and flow is around the trunk and the main roots, the resilience and exchange, and that's what it's doing, is around the, the smaller roots and around the thousands of leaves. Now, the resilience is that they, these can take damage. They can take being uh, blown over, eaten up, or whatever. So, in fact, the economy has to be based first on its ability to endure, which is a resilience function, and that these small, these small aspects of exchange are aggregated up through the main system. We tend to approach the economy the other way around. We design policy to suit large flows and not to, do, to suit resilience. But for much of the foundational economy, as some people call it, that's built on myriads of very small businesses and medium-sized businesses. For them, they need uh, infrastructure to enable them to exchange uh, readily. And the circular economy helps with that because it means that waste is food, that everything is something useful cascading through the system. The essential point would be, to logic would be to mine, all real-world systems, or almost all of them, are complex adaptive systems. At the least they're nonlinear systems, they're feedback-rich nonlinear systems. Materials flows represent this, particularly in the biological sphere. But, you know, that's the way the world works. Now, what will your economics look like if you took that seriously? That's the question. It's sort of, can economics get with the program, please? How can we empower our society to design systems? Uh, with the financial system, for instance, there are some basic rules to that system which give it the shape it is. It just doesn't emerge out of it. I don't believe in this micro foundations thing where it's just a bunch of individuals who, who, who interact with each other and you get an emergent phenomenon. Th this idea of the market as a force of nature is a very good misdirection. In my view, it's not a force of nature. It's a constructed framework, and um, we need a different one, which is much more suited to the uh, the needs of the times and the needs of contemporary science, uh, I would argue. But don't forget, that's the role of the heuristic. Again, uh, most neoclassical economics and uh, following that neoliberal economics is a short story. It's a narrative about how the world works, not just the economy, but how social relationships should be, that we're ultra competitive, for instance. Uh, there's a whole, you know, it's been undone so many times. It's the surprise is it still endures. Now, there's the strength of what a narrative is, as you will know. Narratives endure not because they are right, but because they are useful. As Yuval Harari, interestingly, says that we only get these grand narratives from two sources. Now, uh, one he says is religion. And the other one, he says, uh, is from um, nature. And um, so, if you like, the, the neoliberal uh, economy got its, its idea from, if you like, a, a very competitive nature. It was uh, an evolutionary struggle. And, you know, well, it sounds like it's biological, but you know what I mean? It's very one-sided. We are one-sided selfish creatures, blah, blah, that. We, we're separate. We're not interconnected. We make our own decisions. It was sort of an individualized competitive market loosely based on living systems, but they don't work that way, uh, if you like. Whereas we're now beginning to say, well, actually, there's competition and cooperation. The systems work this way. They're nested. They're networked. It's about the interactions. Well, they're not individuals with a tight boundary around them. They're, they're more connected. So we're beginning to get a, a, a looser sense or a better sense of what drawing ideas from nature means. But you have to have those ideas ready to go. This is the only good thing I think Milton uh, Friedman taught me in reading his stuff, is that um, you have to have a utopia. You have to have a sense of where you're going. And uh, you have to try out bits of it, because if the circumstances occur that allows it to be done, 
It's got to be in a form which is able to be picked up by politicians and tried out. You know, it's got to be worked out. So if you like, much of the energy that I put into circular economy is not about now or tomorrow. It's about helping build a framework that might be able to be just common sense when the time is right. Thank you very much for taking the time. It was very interesting to talk to you. Yeah. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.